for you. That was short from you, Sam. Thanks. And Let's have as we mark the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush tomorrow, I'm sure the whole House will celebrate the contribution of the Windrush generation who have done so much to build the Britain that we cherish today. And, Mr Speaker, this Armed Forces Week, we thank them for all they do to keep our country safe. This morning, I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Patricia Gibson. Yeah. 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 As inflation continues to outstrip pay awards, and tomorrow we expect to see the 13th consecutive rise in interest rates, will the Prime Minister tell the House by how much living standards have fallen during his eight months in office? Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I've always been very clear, inflation is putting pressure on family budgets, and that's why the UK Government has taken decisive action to support families through this difficult time, including households in Scotland who are receiving considerable support, not just with their energy bills, but also the most vulnerable as well. Yeah. Well, Benji, thank you, Mr Speaker. On this yeah. side of the House, we have got a proud record of supporting the nuclear industry, which is an essential part of achieving secure, low-carbon energy. I'm delighted that my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, has given his backing to the next generation of nuclear reactors, including SMR and larger projects, and asked that he now commits to seeing the fuel for these projects manufactured in the UK. This will secure long-term high-skilled employment at key sites in the North West, like Springfields in my constituency, and the supply chain across the UK. Mr Speaker, we are preserving and strengthening the UK's nuclear fuel production capacity through our £75 million nuclear fuel fund. I know that Springfield Fuels, in my honourable friend's constituency, has benefited from £30 million of funding. And he's right to say that our domestic nuclear fuel sector has a critical role to play in supporting the UK's energy security and independence. And I know that he will continue to be a champion for the industry in this House. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the Windrush generation who have contributed so much to our country and to the armed forces in this week and all weeks? Um, and Glenda Jackson's passing leaves a space in our cultural and political life that could never be filled. She played many roles with great distinction, passion and commitment. Academy Award winning actor, campaigning Labour MP and an effective government minister. We will never see talent like hers again. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, one of the Prime Minister's own MPs says Britain is facing a mortgage catastrophe. Does he agree with her? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, can I start by joining the Honourable Gentleman in his uh, tribute to Glenda Jackson? Uh, and Mr Speaker, it's also right that we do support those with the mortgages, and this is why the absolute right economic priority is to halve inflation. Because inflation is what is driving interest rates up, inflation is what erodes people's savings and pushes up prices and ultimately makes them poorer. Now, this is why, a long time before I had this job, I highlighted the importance of tackling inflation. It's why that I said it is never easy to root out inflation, but we will take the difficult and responsible decisions to do so. It's an approach that the IMF has strongly endorsed in their words and describing our actions as decisive and responsible. Yes, Mr Speaker, I realise the Prime Minister spent all week saying he doesn't want to influence anyone or anything. <laughs> it was certainly keeping to that with his answer. He, he knows very well the cause of the mortgage catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. 13 years of economic failure and a Tory kamikaze budget which crashed the economy and put mortgages through the roof. So will the Prime Minister tell us how much the Tory mortgage penalty is going to cost the average homeowner? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, as, as ever, the Honourable Gentleman isn't aware of the global macroeconomic situation. But let me do, but substantively, substantively, well, substantively, what I, what, let me tell him and the House what we are doing to support those with mortgages. We have deliberately and proactively increased the generosity of our support for the mortgage interest scheme. 
We have also established a new FCA commuter duty, which will protect people with mortgages, for example, moving them onto interest-only mortgages or lengthening mortgage terms. And we have spent tens of billions of pounds supporting people with the cost of living, particularly the most vulnerable. But that is a difference between us, Mr Speaker. While he is always focused on the politics, we are actually just getting on and doing the job. Let's test that because the, the question he refuses to answer, he actually knows the, the answer to this question, is £2,900 extra. That's the cost to the average family of the Tory mortgage penalty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, he was warned by experts about this as long ago as autumn last year, but he either didn't get it, didn't believe it, or didn't care because he certainly didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And when I raised this a couple of months ago, he had the gall to stand at that dispatch box and say he was delivering for homeowners. Yeah. <laughs> How is an extra £2,900 a year on repayment delivering for homeowners? Yeah. Well, so, Mr. Speaker, now let, let's, just, let's just look at the facts. Let's look at the facts. Because he talks about interest rates. He talks about interest rates. Perhaps the honourable gentleman could explain why interest rates were at similar levels in the United States, in Canada, in Australia and New Zealand. Why they're at the highest level in Europe that they've been for two decades, Mr Speaker. That's why it's important that we have a plan to reduce inflation. But in contrast, what do we hear from the honourable gentleman? He wants to borrow an extra £28 billion a year. That would make the situation worse. He wants to ban new supplies of energy from the North Sea. That would make the situation worse. And, and he wants to give in to unions unaffordable pay demands. That would make the situation worse. Mr Speaker, he doesn't have many policies, but the few that he does have all have the same thing in common. They're dangerous, inflationary, and working people would pay the price. Seriously. <laughs> Sorry? I don't think we need any more, do we? No. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I Prime Minister has a keen interest in the mortgage market in California, but I'm talking about mortgage holders here. And whilst his government is consumed in law-breaking chaos and division, working people are paying the price. This morning, I spoke to James in Selby. He's a police officer, working hard to keep people safe every day. The Tory mortgage penalty is going to cost him and his family £400 more each and every month. That's nearly £5,000. He told me this morning, they may not want to hear this, he told me this morning that they've decided to sell their house, to downsize, and he's just told his children they're going to have to start sharing bedrooms. Why should James and his family pay the cost of the Prime Minister's failure? Yeah. Well, Mr. S Mr Speaker, I hope when the Honourable Gentleman was talking to James, he explained that his economic policies would make James' situation worse, Mr Speaker. And it's not just... It's not just me saying that, Mr Speaker. The independent, the independent Institute of Fiscal Studies says his policy of never-ending debt and borrowing would damage James because it would increase inflation and drive up interest rates, leaving James and everybody else in this country poorer, Mr Speaker. The IMF has said that our plan prioritises not what is politically easy but what is right for the British people. That is what responsible economic leadership looks like, Mr Speaker. James and his family will have been listening to that, Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, and their plight should keep them awake at night, because over the next few years, 7.5 million people are going to be in the same boat, all paying the Tory mortgage penalty. Exactly. Month after month after month. The situation is so dire that repossessions are already up 50 per cent, a total betrayal of the idea that if you work hard, you'll get on. So what's the Prime Minister going to do to make sure more families don't lose their homes? Yeah. I, Mr Speaker, I know he's reading from his prepared script, but he failed to actually listen to the answer that I gave. 
Well, uh, I, did, I did actually spell out in detail what we are doing, Mr Speaker. We, we've increased the generosity of support for mortgage interest scheme. We did that proactively in advance. We've also established a new FCA consumer duty that will protect borrowers, for example, by allowing them to extend their mortgage terms or switch to interest-only mortgages. And we have spent tens of billions of pounds supporting households with living costs. Those are the practical steps that we are taking to help James and other families who are facing these situations. But what I would say, because he mentioned mortgage arrears and uh, repossessions, I am pleased to say, Mr Speaker, they are actually running at a level today that is below when we entered the pandemic, Mr Speaker, because of the actions that we're taking. But more importantly than that, perhaps, Mr Speaker, is that they are also running three times lower than the level we inherited from the last Labour government. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, I'm sure from the vantage point of his helicopter everything might look fine, but that's not the lived experience of those on the ground. After 13 years of economic failure across the country, people are paying the price of uncosted, reckless, damaging decisions by the Tory party. And even now, as mortgages go through the roof, the Prime Minister is planning to wave through honours and peerages for those who cause misery for millions. What does it say about this government that while working people are worrying about mortgage hike, paying the bills, even repositions, the Tory party is rewarding those guilty of economic vandalism? Mr Speaker, no amount of personal attacks and petty point scoring can disguise the fact that the honourable gentleman does not have a plan for this country, Mr Speaker. He comes here every week to make the same petty points. We are getting on and delivering for this country. Yes, Mr Speaker, inflation is a challenge. That's why we are on track to keep reducing it. We are reducing waiting lists. We are stopping the boats. All while he is focused on the past, focused on the politics. It's all talk. Whereas from this government and from this Prime Minister, we deliver for the country. Philip, I know you're popular. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, my constituents continue to be concerned about energy prices and energy security. Uh, will the Prime Minister assure me that he will not cave in to the extremist bullies from Just Stop Oil and their patsies on the Labour leadership as well? Yeah. Uh, and instead commit and instead commit to developing new oil and gas production in the United yeah. Kingdom which will be good for jobs, good for the economy, and make us less dependent on foreign countries for our energy supply. Well, as ever, my honourable friend makes an excellent point. Putin's weaponisation of energy has amplified the need for greater energy security, and that's why we deliberately have launched new licensing rounds for the North Sea. Official forecasts suggest that a block on North Sea oil and gas investment would mean that the UK's dependence on imports would rise substantially. Mr Speaker, the Labour Party's decision is one that puts ideology ahead of jobs, investment and Britain's energy security. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Uh, Mr Speaker, in in February the Prime Minister told this year House that borrowing costs are back to where they should be. In March he boasted we are on track to have inflation by the end of the year. And in May he then said economic optimism is increasing. Well, given the dire economic reality of today, is it not now clear that he's taken his honesty lessons from Boris Johnson? Uh, Well, Mr Mr. Speaker, the the Honourable Gentleman also failed to mention that not just the Bank of England, not just the OBR, not just the OECD, but also the IMF, all of them have upgraded their growth outlook for the United Kingdom economy this year. Uh, Whilst he and others were predicting that this country would enter a recession, the actions of this government have meant that we have so far averted that, and we continue to be on track to keep reducing inflation, because that is the right economic priority. Can I just say, I want people to be a little bit more cautious on what they say. This is the present serving Prime Minister. The danger will it could be misled in the way that it was put. Stephen Flynn. 
Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, listening to the Prime Minister's answer, I don't think he quite grasps the reality of the economic situation facing households across yeah, these yeah, aisles. Yeah, yeah. How could he? But it doesn't need to be like this. It didn't need to be like this. Yeah, because mortgage deals in Ireland, they're not sitting in excess of 6 per cent, they're around about 4.5 yeah. per cent. Inflation in the euro area, that's not sitting at 8.7 per cent, it's sitting at closer to 6 per cent. Yeah, Britain like is yeah. broke. Now, seven years after their EU referendum, will he finally admit that it was Brexit that broke it? Yeah. Mr Speaker, again, I don't think the honourable gentleman was paying attention earlier. Interest rates in this country are at similar levels to they are in America, in Canada, in Australia and in New Zealand, Mr Speaker. The rise in inflation and interest rates is a global phenomenon, but that's why Early, I set out that it was the right economic priority to have to bring inflation down. That's what this government would do. But that requires, Mr Speaker, that requires difficult and responsible decisions. That's what leadership looks like. I don't think the SNP will ever do the same thing. Virginia Crosby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Wilver, in my constituency of Unismore, is recognised as the best site for small modular reactors <laughs> and large-scale new nuclear in the UK. Given the UK Government's commitment to nuclear and Wilver, when can my unsmall constituents expect to hear the result of Great British Nuclear's small modular reactor competition? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, there will be no greater champion for this technology and her community than my honourable friend. Uh, my understanding is that the first stage of market engagement is already underway. The expectation is that the down selection process will be launched this summer with an ambition to assess and decide on the leading technologies this autumn. The competition will be open, judicious, fair and robust, and I express uh, all my confidence that we will select the best technology for the United Kingdom. I'm sure it's welcoming it. Right, Stephen Furry. Thank you very much. Um, four months after the very welcome Windsor Framework, there is still no restored Northern Ireland Executive or Assembly, and we are facing an unprecedented budget crisis. This situation is untenable. It's getting worse every day, and the government approach seems to be to wait to see if something happens rather than leading from the front. So can the Prime Minister confirm that he's willing to work with the Northern Ireland parties on a financial package for a restored executive, and also will he work more closely with the Irish government to try to drive a process, including putting reform with institutions on the agenda, so that those who want to govern Northern Ireland can do so? Oh. Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for his engagement with me and the Government during this process? I share his frustration, and our focus remains on delivering for the people of Northern Ireland, who expect and deserve their locally elected decision-makers to address the issues that matter to them most. I thank him for his kind words about the Windsor Framework and how it allows us to move forward. And for many years, we have recognised the challenges particularly facing Northern Ireland, and that's why we've provided over £7 billion of funding on top of the Barnet Block Grant since 2014. I can assure him that my right honourable friend, the Northern Ireland Secretary, remains in close contact with all the parties in Northern Ireland to clarify what more is needed so that we can restore the conditions for executive formation. Dr Liam Fox. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Since 2016, cumulative growth in Italy has been 4%, in Germany has been 5.5%, in the UK has been 6.8%. In May last year, British exports to the European Union were not just the highest since Brexit, but since records began. Yeah. The UK had the highest growth of any G7 country in both 2021 and 2022. The Eurozone is currently in recession. We are not. Is it not time we heard more good news talking Britain up? Well, my, uh, my right honourable friend, my right honourable friend is quite right to highlight the improvement in our economic outlook, and he's right to highlight the good positive news showing the strength in the underlying economy. And I know that he joins with me in saying that our economic priority right now must be to continue to bear down on inflation. But while we do that, we are putting the conditions in place to grow this economy. And as he said, unlike the party opposite, we won't talk Britain down, we will grow the country's jobs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last night was another fantastic night uh, at Hamden, a real tonic uh, during yeah. tough times yeah. for Tarn Army yeah. and Scotland yeah. more widely. However, 
Whilst English and Welsh fans could watch their national teams for free on Channel 4 and S4C, only a small fraction of Scots could watch the match, with, it, with many unable to afford the subscription to Viaplay, particularly during this cost of living crisis. So, yep. does it agree with me that this is inherently unfair? And will he ask the DCM DCMS Secretary uh, to meet with me to discuss how we fix this situation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, can I uh, join with my honourable friend in his comments uh, about the match uh, and let him know that I know the Culture Secretary is engaging with him and others on this particular topic, and I'll make sure that she gets back to him. And Marie Morris. Speaker. In December last year, Link conducted some research on cash acceptance. Their research found that nearly half, 45% of people, have been somewhere where cash has not been accepted or has been discouraged, and 49% said being unable or being discouraged to pay in cash was inconvenient. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.